to me, like the most important thing that any of us in this business can say for ourselves is yes. The opposite of always saying yes, the no theory does not work for me. The idea that like no exists is not something I believe in. You know, when somebody says, no, we can't do that. I say, oh, I'm sure we can. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Real Conversations. I'm Dustin Richardson from the Burbank International Film Festival. Today, I'm speaking with the multi-talented Daniel Henning, who founded the Blank Theater and served as its artistic director for three decades, where he produced over 70 main stage productions, 31 seasons of the Living Room series, and 30 Young Playwrights Festivals. He's won many honors for his work. He's a director, an actor, a writer, a book narrator, and so much more. Daniel, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm good, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. What you've done for the community, for actors at all stages of their career, absolutely remarkable. And while preparing for this interview with you, I quickly realized I could take an entire half hour, hour just introducing you because you've done so much, <laughs> sir, so much. So I had to cut it back a little bit so we could actually hear from you. <laughs> but my goodness, I think the best way to start is kind of at the beginning. And I know you've been a performer since your childhood. What kind of drew you to pursue this path? What was your original dreams and goals? I mean, I think originally, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't sort of see that there was a, a world larger than just doing the work. You know what I mean? Like being in plays or being in movies or whatever. And so I did that for, you know, growing up. And then I went to college at NYU. And there I started to learn that this world of entertainment is bigger than just me. There's a way in this business to be able to be the artist that I want to be, but also to create opportunities for other artists. You know, I came to Los Angeles for pilot season. That was for me. And then I founded the Blank Theater. And that was a way to try to create a safe and nurturing place for my friends and other artists to come together to be able to make something greater than themselves. And through that process, I really learned how important that was, but also how needed it was, because a lot of people do still come to it with the me mentality. Through my work at The Blank, I realized there were other opportunities to help not only my fellow actors who were in Hollywood doing the thing, but also to start helping younger people and, and other people coming up. And that's why I founded the Young Playwrights Festival and the Living Room Series and the other work that we did in The Blank, and we still do. I'm just not in charge anymore. But, you know, I realized that, like, I had an ability to create community. Community. Not everyone has that. I did. And I felt like it would be selfish if I didn't use that. From kind of the beginning of the blank, it was always about, well, who else can we bring along? Who else can I help up? I founded the blank before I even realized I was a director. It wasn't to, you know, so that I could direct everything. It was to create this space, you know, in the in the Peter Brook empty space kind of way. And that's why it was called the blank. But then, you know, every time I gave someone else an opportunity or worked on somebody else's play or, you know, produced something, you know, opened it to the world and to Los Angeles Times reviews and awards and the theater community, you know, I realized that that was an important thing and it needed to be done because that play would not have gotten produced if I hadn't done that thing. And then the playwright would just have a lovely thing on paper. Well, now I guess on in digital, but it wouldn't really exist. You know, that's how I kind of started doing that. And I keep trying to do that as much as I can. Community is so important and, and giving people the opportunities. Everyone's always trying to figure out what door to get through, where they can find their people. And that's amazing that you were able to bring that to so many people. It took a lot. I mean, it took a lot from me because I was doing it kind of by myself for a lot of the time. But it also took a lot from all the people who showed up who said, yeah. yes, the most important thing that any of us in this business can say for ourselves is yes, I was dear friends with Ed Asner. And, you know, even at his late, like the end of his life, he was still saying yes to student films because not because he was making any money out of it, but because he knew that that was important. He had done that for me. He was very supportive of me when I first founded the blank and was like a grandpa to me and took me under his wing. And, you know, but I watched him while he's trying to make money and you know, help his family live and all those things and and do good work. You know, he was also saying yes to probably not every student film that came along, mm -hmm. but to ones that he thought that that person was talented or the script was fun or whatever it was, you know. And so that saying yes thing, I try to say that as much as possible. But I also found a bunch of other people who would say yes. And that's how we were all together. We were all able to create that world. You established it in 1990, right? 
So how did you kind of get this moving? Like when you had the idea, like you had to find a theater, you had to find some people to start with. You had the idea, but how did you start really getting the ball rolling? Before I left New York, I was running an off-Broadway theater called Circle in the Square. After the the week ended, one week um, late at night, I was delivering the box office paperwork to the um, to the manager of the theater. I was attacked. Uh, this man came out of nowhere and said, give me your money and brought out a lead pipe out of I don't know where and hit me on the head. Anyway, I was able to save myself. But because I was working at the time, it was uh, it became a workman's comp case because I had a facial scar. I had 47 stitches in my forehead. They gave me $4,000 to compensate me. And so I had this money and I just moved to LA and I had this $4,000 and I was like, well, I can't like go to Disneyland with this or something. Like I have to do something good with this, you know, literally blood money. And so I took that money and I founded the Blank Theater. And then the first show we did was something that I had been working on in acting class with my friends. Two people from that class were sort of my partners in starting the blank and they were gone pretty much immediately. And I was like, no, it's a good idea. I'm going to keep doing this. And, you know, and I had invested that money. And you know, of course, I saw that $4,000 back, you know, a thousand fold. Like I got all that money back the night I watched Stephen Karam, who was a 17 year old young playwright, who I was the first person to say, you have talent, kid. You're amazing because he was a winner in the festival. Then the night he won his Tony Award for the human. I got that $4,000 back that night <laughs> and over and over and over again, watching so many phenomenal people like come through the programs and become a part of the blank and then move on to really great, wonderful success and winning Tonys and all that kind of stuff. And there's lots of them. There's like a go on, you know, Octavia Spencer was surprised when we cast her in a role that didn't have the word black in front of the, 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 the it was a therapist, you know, because she'd never had a role that didn't say black something. And the theater had just continued to grow and grow to what it is today. And it's just done so much. It's unbelievable. It's amazing. Thank you. I mean, it's like the butterfly effect, really. <laughs> it's, it so, is. What a beautiful thing to give the world and to give people. I mean, I loved every second of it. I mean, almost every second of it. <laughs> I mean, it was really hard raising yeah. money and doing all that sort of part of it. But the creation of the art, like the, you know, working with like phenomenal people and, you know, and getting to do new work with them and develop myself as an artist while I was developing whatever piece we were working on or whatever. I'm sure it will always remain the most important part of my life in the thousands of lives that I touched. But I got absolutely as much back, if not even more. Could you tell us about some of the shows and people you've worked with that really stood out to you? We did a lot of work from the Broadway composer, Michael John Lacusa, and Michael John and I actually created a show together called Hotel Salem Moore, which was which we loved. And Vicki Lewis won the Ovation Award for a role that we created for her in that. And, and then I did his The Wild Party and Hello Again. And First Lady Suite is actually uh, uh, recorded by PS Classics. It's the, the cast album of that is ours. And then we did another show of his called Little Fish, which was... Alice Ripley and Greg Jabara, like the season before they won their Tony Awards. I got to work with one of my professors at NYU who was a playwright then. And then, you know, what, 20 years later or something, Chris Durang, I got to do one of his plays and work with Chris. And and then, you know, you look at the like Stephen Karam and you look at Lauren Yee, who is like, well, before the shutdown, she was the second most produced playwright in America. We did two of her plays in the Young Playwrights Festival. Austin Winsberg, who created the series Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. We did five of his plays in the Young Playwrights Festival. I was oh, wow. his mentor and I'm still very close with him. And so other showrunners and TV writers and but also actors and, you know, like an 18 year old Sarah Michelle Geller before Buffy and Allison Hannigan's stage debut, which was during Buffy. We worked with most of the cast of Buffy, actually, over at one point or another, because um, I had coached Sarah on her audition for Buffy. Um, really? We had done an off-Broadway awesome. play together in the 80s and when she was a little girl. Tessa Thompson. And, I mean, there's all kinds of people who came through the program in one way or another and were there for a long time, you know, uh, spent a lot of time. Tessa, I'm sure today, if she had a minute, would come back and do the Young Playwrights Festival again. <laughs> she doesn't have a minute, but if she did, <laughs> you know, and, and Noah Wiley before ER and like I said, Octavia Spencer. And then some people who were already famous or already had their careers and came back to work with us because we were doing interesting things. I got to work with like a thousand writers <laughs> over the time because we did a thousand new plays plus like 350 plays by teenage playwrights. By the way, some of them are like, you know, lawyers or not in the arts, but they all learn something about themselves by being in the Young Playwrights Festival. So I feel like you know, that doctor is a success too, like a success story from because that doctor is coming about their work 
from a different place than they would have had they not had this experience, you know? I may be most proud about the diversity that we were able to create at the blank. Like in 93, we did a production of The Fantastics. It was the first multi-ethnic production of The Fantastics in the U.S. It's directed by Ken Page, who was Oogie Boogie and Nightmare Before Christmas and this phenomenal human. And then that just continued. Like it was always like, yeah, I'm giving everybody opportunities. The array of people is super vast in like all the professions, certainly in the writing profession, in the directing profession, in acting, yes, of course, but also in producing and other things like that, you know. So it's been a it's been a wild ride. <laughs> you said you've developed over one thousand yeah. different plays. Yeah. That is mind blowing. Like <laughs> how are you still tired from all of that? <laughs> uh, yes, I am actually. And that is one of the reasons. Like I just reading, you know, oh gosh, 300, 400 plays a year or something that tired me out. Of course, yeah. what do I do now? But read all day long anyway, but they're books, <laughs> not plays. So they're a little different. But in a way, that's an excellent question because yeah. yeah, I am still a little, yeah. That might be the most important question. You know, you're still resting. How long does it take to recover from a thousand days? <laughs> a while. Yeah, wow. That is incredible. So many hats you wore. I mean, how did you even juggle all that? From the time I was a little kid, I was always like doing weird things. Like I wasn't doing the things that kids were supposed to be doing. I was, you know, I found on my own puppet company when I was 11. I just was always looking at the world in a different way. And so it just comes naturally to me. I mean, it seems weird, but it does, you know? So like, yeah, I taught myself lighting design because there I was and I'm observant and there are great people around me. It's like, oh, that's what that light, oh, that's what that light does. Oh, I see. Okay. And oh, oh, you know, so I just, I'm kind of an, I, like an autodidact that way. So I just learn a lot. And then I was like, okay, well, sure. I can do that. Let's, let's just get that done. The opposite of always saying yes, the no theory does not work for me. The idea that like no exists is not something I believe in. You know, when somebody says, no, we can't do that. I say, oh, I'm sure we can. <laughs> I've done a couple of films that I've done and they were like that too. They were like, oh no, we can just do this. Like I can just scrounge up my pennies and make this happen and let's go do that. I've always been like that, but it was exhausting. That's for sure. And, and I had lots of people helping along the way. I certainly didn't run the blank by myself the whole time, but I don't know. I was compulsed. It's a disease. Actually, I, it's so funny. I don't talk about this ever, but I'll say when I was growing up, there's this uh, back disease that I had when I was, I guess it goes away once you're not a, not a teenager anymore. It's like a German name and it doesn't look like this when it's written, but it's pronounced. I'm not kidding. I had showman's disease. <laughs> Wow. Oh, no. I can't help it. I have showman's disease. <laughs> Not showman's disease. <laughs> Anything but that. <laughs> oh, wow. Just to mention again, the many programs that came out of this, just how wonderful and, and how exciting and an amazing opportunity and experience, especially for the young actors, like you were saying, getting to go through this and to be inspired and work with all types of amazing talent. I always kind of made those opportunities for myself. Like I took college acting courses when I was in high school. I kind of just like would just worm my way into something or other. And I've always done that. But I realized other people aren't as crazy as I am. So that was part of the idea with the Young Clarets Festival. Let's give these young writers an opportunity. But also, how about these young actors? But put them in the same room with, you know, professionals who they know, faces they know. That becomes a moment that like the younger people in the room say, oh, wow. I may be as talented as they are, or at least I'm in a level that I can be in something with them. It automatically tells that young actor even who they are, who they could be. Alison Brie, she, her like very first job in Hollywood was in Young Pirates Festival. And like for two or three years, her bio, her little bio, wherever it was, it was that was the only thing that was listed because she didn't have anything else. And then she's done pretty well for herself. I think she probably got a little bit of a, oh, look at who I'm in the room with. And I guess I am a professional, you know, that thing. So I always tried to fit that, to put high level professionals who have already or are already established, but are also stretching. You know, I'll give them a role that they wouldn't be cast in next to young professionals who don't even know yet what they might fully be able to do. Every choice I always made, I wanted it to be a choice that at the end of the day, that artist would walk away feeling that they had grown as an artist after having been a part of whatever that thing was. That is amazing. Well, thank you for all your hard work because it sure has paid off, like you said. It must be wonderful to see where all these people have gone with their career and, and yeah. to know just the background behind all that. 
That's yeah. awesome. This all kind of led to one day in June 2018. I mean, you were honored by the California State Legislature for your lifetime of artistic work and work in the LGBTQ plus community. I mean, what an honor and how well deserved that must have been a very special day for you. It was indeed. And one of the reasons is when I was growing up, you know, I didn't even know what gay really was, certainly not for me. But, you know, from second grade on, I was called fag and I was bullied and because of who I was, because the person I am now, I was that in second grade. Like I couldn't hide. I couldn't, I didn't know that I was gay or what that was. I was just a big personality and I would just wear colorful things. And I didn't really, I mean, I cared that people were mean to me, but I didn't really care. So, you know, I grew up like being ridiculed and bullied because of who I was, you know, cut to 2018. I've now taken exactly who I was. I haven't hidden any of that at this point. And I used all of that energy to support the artistic community, which was a huge part of me. And then as I became an adult, the gay community, which was is a huge part of me. And then to be honored for something that I was bullied over, like my whole childhood, that was quite a moment for my state recognizing me in that way. It was extremely powerful. And if I still carried any, you know, bit of whatever from from that experience of growing up, it all went away that day. Um, because, you know, those people weren't being honored <laughs> in the state assembly and the state senate that day. <laughs> they don't have a big like thing on their wall that says, you're a great human. Thanks for all you did. Like, you know, um, but I do. So, you know, the fact that I persevered through all that, this was part of my gift. I got so many gifts by being who I am, but that was certainly one of them for sure. So yeah, it was a pretty powerful moment. The idea of changing myself, I don't even know that it even occurred to me. You know, I was so very specifically me, you know, and I know most kids aren't just recently saw some of my report cards and like almost all of them said, you know, has trouble getting along with others. And I think about that now and I'm like, no, it was the others who had trouble getting along with me. Over the past few years, you've been doing some amazing work as an audiobook narrator. And one book in particular, 2021, made you an Audio Award finalist for Best Fantasy Audiobook. For, of course, the New York Times bestseller, The House on the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Clune. I believe you're still working with him on some of his newer books as well. And yeah. I mean, what led you into this? Because you're a fantastic narrator. Thank you. Thank you very much. I took many years to transition out of the blank because I wanted to leave the company in good shape. And so as I was doing that, I was also thinking I never made much money at the blank, but I made a little bit. So I was like, well, I have to augment that somehow. And there was a playwright. Uh, I worked on this play. We did it on the main stage. And uh, I knew he worked in audiobooks or something. And a year later, I saw him again. And I was like, hey, you direct audiobooks or something? He's like, well, I'm actually the casting director for the largest audiobook company in the world. It's like, oh, <laughs> what do you think? And he said, I think he'd be great, actually. And so he gave me my first book and he gave me my first 10 books. And then after that, I was like, yeah, I think I can do this. And, you know, so then I, you know, really kind of put my nose to the grindstone, as they say, and really met all the people and just decided to really create a career. Yeah, I got to work with TJ Clune on The House in the Cerulean Sea. Last year, he and I did a book together called In the Lives of Puppets. And then this year, I will be doing, I'm so excited, his new book called Somewhere Beyond the Sea, which is the sequel to The House in the Cerulean Sea which was supposed to be a standalone book. It was only supposed to be the one book, but it is such a massive juggernaut success, that book. It sold close to 2 million copies. You know, they had to create sequels. I'm working with writers again, right? <laughs> I can't seem to get away from that. <laughs> Not that I want to, but here I am doing it again. And I love it. I mean, when people retire, you know, they say, oh, I'd like to just sit around reading books all day. Well, I get to do that. <laughs> but I get paid for it. <laughs> like in The House on the Cerulean Sea, I do like 70 characters in that book. I had no idea I had that skill <laughs> um, until I got a book that required me to do a bunch of characters, which scared me to death. And then, you know, okay, well, I, uh, this is the job. So I guess I'll do it. You're a writer as well. And in yeah. 2017, you won a Telly Award for best writing for your play, The Tragedy of JFK as told by William Shakespeare. Fantastic title. Very interesting. Thank you. Which you also <laughs> directed. Could you tell us a little bit about that play? Sure. Well, one of the crazy things throughout my life that just caught my eye and I, I spent like 25 years researching is the JFK assassination. The whole while I was working on this play because I had realized that in writing Julius Caesar, Shakespeare was prescient to many of what I believe are the 
underlying facts of the JFK assassination. And I was reading along one day and I realized, oh, wait a minute. Oh, my God. Some of these are literally identical to what happened in 1963. The tragedy of JFK, as told by William Shakespeare, is mostly Shakespeare's Julius Caesar edited. So the things that don't make sense to the JFK story gone. There are historical speeches and things that are put into it as well. And I have changed the character names and place names to match the JFK assassination. So <laughs> so that's the JFK play. I know you're a big Star Wars fan. <laughs> and you have a fantastic story. When you were 12 years old, you met Alec Guinness, you chatted with him. And this moment even made it into Guinness's final memoir, I believe. Do you yeah. mind sharing that story with us real quick? Sure. Yeah, no problem. When Star Wars came out, I was like 11 or something. I saw it in the movie theaters 102 times. I saw it 100 times and then I stopped. I was like, that's enough. And then it was re-released like six months later or something. I was like, well, I'll go two more times. So I'd seen it 102 times. And I had at that point, I'd actually met Mark Hamill and I met Gary Kurtz, the producer. And I had met, I guess, David Prowse maybe. And I was in a movie called The Black Stallion, which was produced by Francis Ford Coppola. And it was premiering at the San Francisco Film Festival. And also at the San Francisco Film Festival was the opening night gala, which was a tribute to Alec Guinness. And I knew that Sir Alec did not really give autographs and it was a pretty rare thing. And, and I also knew that he kind of was curmudgeonly about Star Wars. And I asked my mom to get us tickets for that opening night for my birthday. And she did. And there was a Q&A. And I was like, I bet I can get him to give me an autograph. I bet you if I ask in front of all these people, he'll say, I'll just run down to the stage and he'll sign it and whatever. And it'll be a fun little moment or whatever. So in the Q&A, I stood up. I was all the way in the back and I stood up. And, and you know, and I had just seen an hour's worth of clips of him in like all of his, you know, his real work, right? Bridge in the River Kwai, you know, the Lavender Hill Mob, like, you know, just amazing work. Anyway, so I stood up and I said, Sir Alec, I've seen Star Wars 102 times. And he literally fell out in his chair. He like flopped and, you know, whatever. And he made a big joke of it. And then he kind of came back and he's like, it's, it isn't even my best film. And I said, and it would mean very much to me if I could have your autograph. And he said, I'll see you after the show. And... I was like, oh, and I had been backstage at the Palace of Fine Arts because that's the Black Stallion had just premiered. So I had just been there. And so I knew where the stage door was and I go on the stage door and the, my mom and I would come in and they take us over to this little place and they have us sit there. And like people are kind of gathering around because the audience like laughed when, you know, like it was a kind of a big thing when he, him just saying that, whatever. And they brought him over to me. And the very first thing he said to me is, I feel like I should give you some of my money back meaning all the money he made from Star Wars because I paid for it 102 times. <laughs> um, and there was a big laugh and everyone's watching this because, you know, this is kind of a weird thing. So that we had this lovely little moment. We chatted for a few few minutes and he said, I'll give you that autograph, but I'm going to ask something of you. And I said, anything, anything. And he's like, you're not going to ask, you're not going to like what I'm going to ask you. And I said, anything. And he said, do you think you could manage never to see Star Wars again? Like you say, he told that story in his final memoir. And he told it exactly as I remember it, word for word, up to that point in the story. And then in his version of the story, when he asked me that, I burst into tears and my mother said, how dare you speak to a child like that and dragged me away. That's not what happened. I said, I thought about it and I was already, I'd seen it 102 times at that point. I knew it every frame and my burned into my retina. And I said, yes, I can do that. And so he gave me the autograph, which if his story is true, I wouldn't have the autograph. I have the autograph and it says to Danny, remember you promised not, underlined, to see Star Wars again. Uh, what does it say? Good wishes always, Alec Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> and I took my thing and left. And then 16 years after he wrote that final memoir that a friend of mine saw an internet article online about how Alec Guinness hated Star Wars and forwarded it to me, somebody I knew then, isn't this you? It was in 1999 he wrote that. In 2016 was when I found out that he had told that story and that I was, in fact, a famous Star Wars fan all over the world. People know that story. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. <laughs> I just noticed R2-D2 is right back there. Yes, indeed. Didn't even R2, notice till now. <laughs> yeah, R2's there. And uh, and I have the, the big, huge standee C-3PO, but you can't see it. It's on the other side of my recording booth here. But yeah. And you have the autograph on your wall. Is that what you did? I you do. Just... Yeah, I do. I, uh, I, I actually, not the real one. That's safe 
away. Mm -hmm. So that's a, I copied it and do that. But yeah, I have it on my wall. I did this wall during the shutdown of like, just not like my theater career or whatever, but just like things, just because I've had a lot of funny things like that happen in my life. So that's what this whole wall is, is like just little other little moments of other than just my career. And so that's up there. Did you never watch Star Wars again then? Or I've never seen Star Wars again completely. The caveat is two caveats. One, George Lucas has played with that movie so much that it's not the same movie. So even if I had seen it again, I don't know that it would count. But <laughs> it's had two major re-releases since, in the years since. I went once each time. So I've never seen it on video. I've never seen it on DVD. I don't own it on video. I don't know, like, not, like, so I kept that promise, except those two major re-releases 20 years after I made the promise. But I left the theater for 10 minutes, for the same 10 minutes, both times I saw it. So I'm saying I have never seen Star Wars again because I have not seen all of Star Wars again. <laughs> and I guess he didn't mean the sequels, right? Were, are you allowed to see other Star Wars films? I, I, I guess so. I mean, did he even know they were really, you know, he, yeah, I don't he wouldn't think he could have figured out that all that was going to happen, right? <laughs> I've seen all the sequels once because I feel like that's kind of in keeping with what he asked of me. Yeah. But just once, um, you know, not 102 times. But I haven't, like, the other stuff I've seen Mandalorian and and I've seen Obi-Wan because it's him, right? Obi-Wan Kenobi because it's him, you know. Part of why he asked me not to see it is because that he thought he saw uh, perhaps star shells of madness beginning to form in my eyes. <laughs> he didn't want me to grow up in a banal, you know, fantasy world. But what's really interesting in that, actually, he's talking about the super fan, which didn't exist. That was not a thing. At least in his world, I was the first person he met who'd seen it 102 times. That was a shocking thing to him, especially because he had his very specific feelings about it. But what he's talking about that he saw in me, which wasn't true, is how a lot of people live now. You know, the people yeah. who really are super fans and who, you know, their whole life is encompassed by whatever the thing is that they love, the Marvel world or this or that or whatever, or all of those worlds, you know. And so he mistakenly identified me as something that he was seeing that was going to happen in the future. Yeah. And he was right about that. <laughs> it just wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> that is fascinating. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> it took me a while to really like think that through, you know, but that is exactly what he was saying. Even he writes about that, the star shells of madness. And that's what he means. And good on you for keeping your promise and in, in the way that you can. That's that's awesome. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he never would have known about Disney Plus or <laughs> yeah, anything any, else. Yeah, you know, yeah. in really conventions and all, all, mm -hmm. all that world and, you know, people getting, you know, people getting married with star troopers at their wedding and stuff like that. Like, <laughs> that's the stuff he was talking about, right? Yeah, but yeah. None of it had even happened yet, but he saw it. He saw that that was what was going to happen out of, a, you know, out of all that. So it's interesting. Wow. That is really interesting. There should be a whole documentary about that. <laughs> that whole concept exactly. with him in the center of it. Alec like, Guinness was right. <laughs> exactly. The prophecy. <laughs> the prophecy of Comic-Con. <laughs> exactly. I wrote a little version of the story, a little 45-minute version that I actually did a little 45-minute audiobook of as well. It's called Alec Guinness Hated Star Wars. And in it, I just, you know, I had to think about like, what was his hatred of it? I think it had to do with art versus commerce. Because mm -hmm. the very first thing he talked to this you know, 12 year old boy about was the money he made on it, you know, which even at the time it was a little like people laughed, but it was also like, why are you talking to a 12 year old boy about money? So it's interesting, like trying to figure out what his motives and then why in his telling of the story, which was word for word accurate, he must have kept a diary or something. He then changed the story. Like, why did he do that? And yeah. he was super kind to me he, and, and he turned himself into a curmudgeon, you know, and I think it was because he wanted to make a bigger point. Is there any advice you'd give to any aspiring artists out there who might be watching this episode? Be yourself. That's all you have. And that's all you need. Perfect advice. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. I really appreciate your time. It was wonderful to talk to you. Thank, thank you, so you Dustin. You too. It's really great to meet you. Thank you for watching the Burbank International Film Festival's Real Conversations. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. We are the media capital of the world and our festival has a lot to offer. So stick around to see more episodes and other festival content.